Those used to be pleasant. Those little critters used to be pleasant. Then I would found out it was attached to people. And those people were supposed to be doing things that were supposed to be self-protective on their own. Each one on their own. Then I found out that we don't do that. And I started to realize how this game was played over time in history. Time out of mind, as they say. And so that kind of dictates what's either going to happen to us or what we're going to have to do to keep things from happening to us. And uh, I, I went, I was, I'm going to talk about this. I was, I was uh, leading, uh, leaving with it last week about this article, and I wanted to go through it. I read it again last night, and I got even more disgruntled with this this article. Almost to the point that I didn't want to start talking about it again. But it does, it's instructive to us. And so I want to go ahead and do some of that. But I'm going to talk a far, a problem, maybe a far le- less than what I was going to read through because I started to realize if I was to apply these things in a legal paper to, res- uh, to respond to the system, it would, it would be deemed to be irrelevant. The, the, the discussion that I'm going to lead into, which speaks toward the First Amendment, was actually should have been speaking toward the Fifth Amendment. And the examples wouldn't have even been applicable relative to the the condition. And again, it's examples of how we really don't do it quite right, and gotten our uh, allowing the other side, uh, the system, those in power who want to maintain that power by whatever fiction and uniform and costume, it allows them to maintain it. Which I've been attempting for the ten years now. I've been broadcasting to explain how this works, so we can not get ourselves all tangled up like we had been in the past. We're going to in the future, actually, if you're lucky, because what they're doing now and then what they've got it to is you're lucky to get to survive the initial contact, which should really shock us to action, but it doesn't seem to. It seems it's as if people say, oh, that's going to be the next guy or gal. This is BTW RLM 323, for those of you on PassCast and Podcast, podcast, and whatever cast we do, blogcaster. So that if you uh, hear it or you see it anywhere in the future, hopefully you can look, look, type in that number, BTWRLM three two three behind the woodshed and Real Liberty Media, any of those, and and you'll hopefully get the content and the content uh, links that I will be speaking to. You can read and start if you're interested. Again, I can only speak to those that are going to be interested to do eventually do something not just t- complain about it, that you will, if you needed a lead, uh, it'll be a start, and you can move from there. And that, that's all I can really do. A part of this discussion I'm going to have today is a lot difficult, because it's it's a, it's, it's a one-sided discussion. First the article, then I respond, and there's really, sometimes I know what, there's things that you, if you were hearing the conversation more than just a presentation of a written article, an explanation that would be, Lots of holes filled in that seemed to exist. Or you'd find out there was a real failure. And so this is a, like a really imperfect way to respond to this. But it's, pro, it's sufficient enough that at least the subject matter areas are there. Any errors of interpretation, that would be worked out at some point. I don't know when that would ever happen. But this is what I want you to be aware of, these things I tell you, so that when you get faced with these conditions... You learn to think past the programming, which is happening. I think it's happening in this article, the more I've read it, which was this discussion of you're under arrest, how the police state muzzles our right to speak truth to power. And it was written by John Whitehead, which you know, the guy wrote a book, and he promotes a book, and he talks about the police state. And I tell you, he'll, talk, he'll use all the words of military, but he'll call it a police state. It's a, it's a military state. Now, we could have our, our difference on how we describe that. I wouldn't even have a problem with him fixing on it and explaining to you what he sees as a so-called police state and how we're there. What nobody seems to do, though, is offer a more appropriate review that if you are there, how are you going to respond to it? What is in your mind before you get there? How do you reduce the of you being the next meme for how badly you were treated in front of a, a, an occupier? Is, is really what I've been trying to help people avoid. And a couple of you have done that. They've 
whether I know you or not, and those of you that I do, that I see the glimpse, you've taken this stuff and you've used it and you've kept yourself out of the, the serious clutches, or at least minus, minimized the problem that you may have had if you hadn't really had a brain in your head about how this really is working down. And so I have a problem with really doing some of these discussions. And I'll just say, I, I in fact, one took one of my tabs out because as I was looking at this article to discuss, the next one was even more difficult to discuss. And I said I couldn't, I wasn't going to be able to do a lot of that, the really finite problems over the air. It's just too much. Uh, you have to have a certain awareness before I can even begin to parse through some of this. And this is the part of the problem, parsing through what's good and bad. And if you take a, a position and you got to hold that position in the article, then there's another thought you need to be having too is, what if it's not that position? Or what if the description that they're talking about defines something otherwise? If it defines a condition otherwise and you apply the old rule, then aren't you just wasting your time? And this is what I try to focus you on. Don't waste time on what you think ought to be. You better find what is and you better deal with it on those terms. However bad that looks or however violative it f seems. I guess the, the, the thing that occurs to me is you don't argue with someone who's got a gun. You just don't argue with them. There is a way to communicate with them, and, with them, and that's where we, where I kind of found we have an inroad. I wouldn't do this with a, just a, just anybody who didn't have a thought in their brain about what they were doing. If they didn't have a conscience about it, and this is the last little vestige of protection we have, is that the guy that's in costume or the gal that's in a costume, thinking they're the authority. You still have an inroad because they have a liability in they already know about. And that's what you're exploiting. And so th this is not like someone who wantonly is trying to commit a crime. This is someone who's getting away with a crime as long as you allow it. But to the extent now that the, the veil is so thin between the occupation and their ability to be immune that it almost loses every, there's almost nothing to see that's a protection. And, and so, again, I'm trying to show you here in examples by the no, that we call it the news. It's the me, alternative media. It's the MSM. It doesn't matter. I can look as you've heard me done, doing for years. I can look right through the title and tell you what the condition is. I can look through the discussion and pull out more. And what I'm pulling out is not to read the article. It's to this is a condition you need to protect from. You need to protect against it. And this is how. And this is the point I, I think I bring different than I think lots of other places. Oh, yeah, I've heard lots of people talking about filing paper in court and doing all these things, but that's not what I'm really talking about. In fact, when you really truly listen to what I'm saying, you're finding remedies within the, con the structure of the occupation, which removes that from what you have to deal with, which gives you a statement in, in point when they try to do the railroading that they can't. And so because it seems inevitable. And there's a, also, a, what is this? It's almost like a, a casino. We live in an open-air casino, too. You never know when you're going down the road, when you're going to be, it's, when your, your sevens come up. And then all of a sudden they're on you. And this is where I got involved in this year, decades and decades ago, where I got pulled over on a made-up charge, and, and then they, bought, and I don't know, like I said, I don't know how I'm here to talk to you today, because I thought I was dead. It didn't happen, so I'm here. But that's certain, that was my wake-up call, if you will. That we don't, we, there was going to be now no, not a time when we would not understand that we lived in a place that, uh, that wasn't told to us, but had already existed around us. And we were going to be shown that world, and it was going to become more stark and present to us. And now we see you can't even, even go down the road innocent, and you'll be made out to be a criminal like I was then. But then they'll they'll actually kill the evidence, kill the witness against the the problem by killing you. No body, no case. The entire, so you understand that the subtlety is even with all their immunity, they still have a, a a danger that they will they're now thinking about how they get rid of. And you have to start to start to avoid that. Now like we talk in some of the most obvious ones like the cops and stuff, but there, this happens down with liabilities that the government will come and beat you down. Or, or puts the threat of force on you. That could be all the way down to so-called child services, where they, uh, these agencies come in and call the cops in. Or this could be just code enforcement, where eventually you, they get you involved wrongly, but you don't know how to avoid it. Uh, and then they're going to have threats of the courts coming against you, which then relies on the cops to come beat you down. 
Uh, this could be on people who believe they have more authority or can just be a pain and make a complaint that invokes all that against you. But if you, my view and my experience has been if you don't respond to these things much more appropriately and get yourself much more engaged with what is, is anticipated, what they're going to bring you and how you're going to respond, then you're, you're likely going to become the fodder. If you're likely going to become those examples we hear in the news that I talk about uh, eventually. And then, and then they're bad examples because they're the things that we shouldn't do. And although that's important, to understand how not to do it, there's thousands of ways you can do it wrong. There's really a, only a few ways to do it right. And so I felt, my, for myself, my time is best spent to find the expectation and the proper response. And since I've been doing that, my, my studies have become a lot more refined. My ability to cut, knock out everything else that's nonsense and noise is quick, is very quick. And I can still focus on what I need to do. And what I've, how I've done that, and that no one will like to do this, is you have to study what's going on. And that's having to look into court cases and to analyze what actually goes on. Don't make up the stories about it, but look at it. And like, like I was telling you, we looked at that Tim's case. To me, that's still, I can't tell you how big a case that is, actually. But you look inside that case, and they're telling you a whole lot of truth in that case, but they also make some mistakes. And they also, and it's out and regarding their other, the, the other decisions the Supreme Court made. They're also telling you the condition. They're telling you that it did change. And I'm telling you, take that as a fact and understand that if you continue in your ideas about what's going on, you may become, again, one of these victims that we're going to read about. But uh, the alternative media will say, oh, look how bad the cops were. And what this was is everyone making the wrong step. And that's being, that is allowed to be uh, promoted, the bad steps. And yet I turn around with uh, the people I work with or anybody that would listen to me on a problem they have. The interactions with authorita at that point have become non-threatening. We turn the table really quickly, and then there's no future, There's at this point that I can see over quite a few years now, no future interaction because they realize that you're a little bit more prepared. They literally are looking. They don't know you in the roulette, the, the roulette wheel of being in contact. They don't know who you are, and they'll tell you that. I don't know who you are. Well, you have to use that against them, but that doesn't matter for, the, for this discussion. You, they don't know who you are, and that's, that's right. You're supposed to be presumed innocent, but you don't know that roulette wheel is going to point on you that day that you're going to be interacted. That, that when that happens and you have the right answer, or the better answers, the likelihood of you surviving and making a point is a lot, lot higher if you start using what I've been suggesting over all this time. And so I'm going to go through that today. I think I've said this enough here to get, I'm hoping people are listening. I don't know. Uh, the subtleties of what I speak through are what I have never told you all that I've learned that I just talk through. That it makes all the difference in how we discuss this. And sometimes I just can't get to you what it takes. I look at things really a whole lot different. Not because I want to be different. But because what I've looked at in what they're promoting for us to do has been the wrong thing to do. And when you pull yourself off of that, you, get, you jump off of that wagon, you find yourself back on the road. You see where that road leads or what's supposed to lead. And then you can take the better path. You can see if you want to continue down there. And I found out I didn't. I'm talking about, like this article talks about comply or die. Like he's the, this guy here is the kind of, this is comply or die. Folks, I wrote about the observation that it was comply or die in documents back in the late 90s, 1990. So I've looked at this very point for a long time. And given it's comply or die, and not what we all thought it was, you better take cognizance of that and respond through that very point. And here's the point. It's comply or die. That sounds terminal, but this is where the interesting part is. It really isn't. And this is where I took issue with this article here. I'll read it now again, the title. You're under arrest. How the police state muzzles our right to speak truth to power. So let's look at that title. Uh, let's, uh, we'll go through some of this and I'll read it and uh, try to show and, and parse through something to give you hopefully an insight, an awareness. And this will apply just about without any government and in any government capacity, this will apply. And I think even an administrative side where it's, there's no threat, but you're under arrest. How the how the state muzzles your right to speak? Well, that was really problematic to me to start with. You're under arrest 
do you have a right to speak? Well, this is a problem of interpretation, I guess, if you would, if I can give an extension of innocence here to an attorney. Uh, if I'm under arrest, my right to speak is actually controlled with by what? Not the right to speak, our First Amendment, but it's con constrained now by whether or not I elect the what? The Fifth Amendment, my right to remain silent. And so under arrest, I absolutely have not have been constrained in my right to speak. So we already see now a problem and an anomaly developed absolutely within the context of a condition. The question I have is I'm under arrest. Okay, uh, does that mean it's a lawful arrest? And this is not an argument. This becomes where you become the, and this is the point where your, your speech is not interfered with. You have a right to create the defense at the first point of first contact. Where did I learn that? Did I make that up? No, a judge. Well, I, I learned it, and then I tested it with, through a friend. Wherever ever opportunity I had at the time early on, I would uh, offer things to people to try. And it wasn't just an experiment. It was to prove out things and have them actually intending that they would work. What we didn't know is how the system would respond once you found the right thing to do, how they would respond to that when you did it. In other words, deny it, which is what they tend to do. But where did we learn, uh, where did I learn for sure of the point of, point of first contact was a judge who said uh, in a, another case that when you get a cop on the stand, it's a simple traffic issue, let's say, you can't ask anything outside of what you discussed from the time he stopped you and the time he wrote the ticket and sent you on your way. You can't bring anything else into evidence. They won't consider it. Well, I learned that before, and I made sure that anybody who knew me made uh, had a list of questions that they would make up uh, had ready to go on their little card. It's kind of like the beginnings of, of the bag of law now I use. Uh, if you go to Jefferson Mining District, you can go and see what we've now created for the mining laws, the bag of law for miners. It's also got highway stuff on it so that it will help everywhere else uh, for ingress and egress on your on your roadways, not on the defined uh, transportation way. And so, distinction, but getting back to the point, you have with you the information you're going to need to ask. When you turn in, when you get stopped, you turn into that investigative reporter. Right there, I'm already, I didn't know it before until I was thinking it last night. When I turn, when I tell people to become the investigative reporter, I tell all the guys I work with that are minors that have to, have to interact with the, uh, the, the enforcement, whether that's a law, so-called law enforcement agency officer or a cop or a sheriff or whoever, they have their bag of law, they become the investigative reporter. Isn't that invoking the press underneath Article 1 in a way? And I didn't even realize that until last night looking at this, but that's in fact where you could say you're having the First Amendment invoked when you turn into, under the scrutiny of, a, of a, an allegation, a, a, a reporter, a private investigator on your own case. I didn't say an arguer. No, I said an investigator. And so here, you're, right, you're under arrest. How the police state muzzles your right to speak, truth to power is a condition, folks, you've got to put your mind in it, that makes that statement really um, oxymoronic, I guess, an oxymoron. How, how, do, how are you in the free speech side when you're actually presuming you're under arrest? You're actually now kicking yourself into the choice of the Fifth Amendment, not the First Amendment. I say, though, because of a judge said that you have the, only the ability to talk and, talk and question an officer on the stand if you get there, and this would even include in code enforcement officers and all these other people that may testify against you. You have to make your record on the record during the hearing. You can only talk about the time of the interaction at the time you were involved at the very first time relative to that stop. It means your constitutional rights are irrelevant. It means everything else you think is irrelevant. It has everything to do with what the facts you set up at the time. So my experience and the judge's statement to me, which we we took to the bank, and that's how we go to the, we went to the next step, and we exploited the next point about uh, being whether or not the statutes pertain to persons strictly or can extend beyond and into a man. And so those are where your tailored your questions are tailored to create the body of evidence you can then get asking the officer again. The very fact that I get to inquire upon at the first point of contact to do something in where I can speak, and I have to continue to speak in order to make the questions, is not a muzzling, is it? It's almost, it's in fact, if you look at it correctly, it's a requirement that they allow you to do. Now, we've heard, and this, this report talks about where now the, the, they, they tell you to shut up and you can't talk. I found you can still talk. Now, 
please, 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 do not get arrogant with this. If you've got a guy with a gun or a gal with a gun, do not argue with them. But you can proper bearing. You put yourself back in a state of neutrality. Don't get a. You, you've got to get very calm about this. There's a, you're doing a lot of work here underneath a very serious problem. You have the ability to ask certain questions. And I cannot tell you what those are, and I cannot extend to you what you're going to find in the moment. I can only say, listen to what I'm saying now, and put your mind on it, and prepare, and prepare, and read. And as I've had a couple of guys tell me when it happened, by themselves, faced with two law enforcement authority, one with a gun, in the middle of the forest, they were able to turn down the, the temperature of the of the event, uh, actually got the one, the Leo so-called, because they brought out the law quickly in the proper way, nice and calm. The Leo offer, was, uh, Leo was actually the first one to leave the property because we, I told them the point of first contact when you bring the law back, they don't want to know the law. In fact, they'll do everything to try and evade the law. And so that's what you have to bring first. That's exactly what you're looking to bring. So this is all event condition, situation specific. And I could never, ever give you the answers. There's nothing here that's a, a boilerplate. You really have to have this stuff in your mind about how, th how this works down. And you will ask at the point of first contact very specific things relative to what? What you make up? What you think your rights are? No, relative to what your case is, your defense is going to need, the way the occupier looks at it. And so when I see you're under arrest, how the state muzzles your rights, I'm, I, my experience is, is this is attorney talking. No, my right, my understanding is, this is you're not muzzled at all. In fact, it, it empowers a certain condition. It empowers your right to make your defense. It empowers your right to make a record as it's going down, and it's the only time you get to do it. And if you know these things that are listed out and you put them in summary bullet form, that's your response later on. This is all for the future. And I say today now, because of how dangerous it is, you better have a recording device. Hopefully it's a camera, and if not, then you have a recorder. And if not, even then, then you take a mental note and write it all down and then submit. You get that ready to make an affidavit. Because then you'll submit that, and then you'll ask your questions if you want to make an evidentiary thing. I'm saying this not that you're even going to make it, because once you start doing it this way, I find that you never get to court normally. But now you have to survive the interaction. The only way I know to survive the interaction is get the cop off of his game. And the only way you do that is not argue with them. You present the things you're going to need in your case. That's not being muzzled. That's understanding what your rights are underneath this, uh, this force in, uh, of lawlessness. And I'm speaking in the concept when there's actually no probable cause because that's your first question. You're going to, you're going to confirm that right up front. Why? I don't say it because it's my opinion, because that's what the courts say the turning point is. If a cop has probable cause, you're pretty much underneath the authority, no matter whether it goes off the wheels or not. If they can articulate a probable cause, what we call, what the courts I read long ago, before it's not just probable cause for most people, is the articulable basis for the stop, which has to be based in crime. You don't argue that it is or not, you just establish that they have it or not. If it's wrong, you just take note that it's wrong. You don't argue with the fact that it's wrong. So these, what I'm telling you to do here is very subtle. It's not argumentative. It's collection of information. It's orally getting things on record also to be presented later. And I find out if you pile up enough of these things, they end up going away, and you never get there. Or if they get there, they drop the charges. Or when they get there and you go to the first hearing, they realize that they're going to go down a bad road. And because you're also setting up then your response, how you're going to go after them because they did it wrong. But you can't go in there with your opinion. The point is, I want to get, let's get right up to the front. You have to survive any more today, like I found out 30-something years ago when it first became apparent to me. I don't know of anybody else that was looking at this. So from my world, I was the first to see it for myself for sure. But they were willing to kill you on a traffic stop. And yes, at the time, I had everything you need. I was all perfectly fine. In fact, the end of that thing where that court case went, the judge got all fired up all over the uh, the cop and the prosecutor for how wrong I was treated by them. That was my very first court case, folks. I didn't know anything going in, but I certainly picked it up going on. And, and so, the point of first contact, I already knew about that somehow before I got proof of it. And so I was making a record while I'm being 
accosted by five of these cops, guns drawn, while they're doing what you hear them do on the videos, telling you all kinds of nonsense, giving you five people talking to you, screaming at you, making all kinds of stupid commands that are not consistent, is not the place you want to start arguing with anybody. What I realized I started to do is I was I had to gain some control over this this noise of commands and uh, trying to set up the fact that you were not doing what you were told. This is the worst condition. Uh, not to say that it's that it will solve anybody else's point because it could be just one cop telling you rapid fire a bunch of in, uh, incongruent orders. You have to you well I yelled out I said which one of you is making the order. Now that, that caused them to have to answer because now they re, I made a record openly that I was confused, not by saying I was confused, by saying, who am I listening to? And so you have to do this real time. That gave me just enough time because then they worked. They looked at each other, you just how this all working down. And to my mind, my mind was working in bullet time. Everything was kind of in slow motion. And so I said, who's the one I'm listening to? And that gave me enough moment. But they had to look at each other and decide that the guy who made the initial stop was the one that they had to all say. Uh, he, the guy that made the initial stop took command, which gave me another moment to ask the question of the incongruent the commands he was making on me. And I was able to gain in just the slimmest amount of gra grasping of the condition some measure of control to slow the process down. And say, and then confront him with his incongruent orders. Like, what do you want? You want me on the ground, or you want me standing here, or you want me in your car? Which one? Well, what I did is I took all the commands that were coming at me, and I synthesized them into a sentence back to the guy they've already given back command. I can't tell you how to do this, folks. I don't even know if the next guy that tries this, it'll work, if they're just going to pull down on you and let, let the lead fly. But what you have to do is you have to slow down and take control of the con situation you have no control over. And this is working in their mind. You don't think of your mind controller. This is what they respond to. Because I think the only thing I'm saying, I told you, they have embarrassment and they have some liability for as little as we hear. And you're working on that. So in that, you're not muzzled at all. In fact, that's your duty. If you want to survive the next minute, your duty to yourself is to gain some measure of communication control. Anyway, get back to this article. I haven't started reading it. You're under arrest. You're right, how, there's, how the state muzzles your right to speak. To, to speak. He, this, uh, this lawyer, attorney, wants to focus everybody on the First Amendment. When if you're under arrest, you're actually not dealing with really that at all in some regard. You're dealing with the Fifth, and they're even encroaching on that. But you have to start being able to get into a dialogue of do you want to speak or not. Now, what they won't tell you, what I have never heard anybody say, well, it's it's implied when you listen to what they say about you. Well, you anything you can, you say can and will be used against you. Well, you can say stuff that can't be used against you. That's the other study you have to do. And this is again not just with cops. This has to do with government. Anybody who comes with a color of an authority, you respond this way, and you qualify what they're that they're there lawfully they might be able to put together enough plausible plausible reasons that makes it legit. You better, you have to be careful of that. You're interested in making sure, ultimately, you make a record that there's at least a question, even if they want to go down the route that I just assumed it was correct. Assumptions are not good, and presumptions are, are things to rebut it. And that's what we're dealing with. The, really the rebuttal. They assume they can do this to you, but then they find out it's a it's a presumption that they could, and they don't have you rebut the presumption by demanding the particular. You want to talk about a bill of particulars after after you get into a, into a case. I guess the investigative reporter asks that right up front in the point of first contact of the cop, the one in command. And then after you ask a few questions, I just uh, shouldn't lead so much. There's so much that's involved here, but it's all in an instant, I guess, is the problem. A right to speak has nothing to do after you're under arrest, folks. I just give it to you that way. You have the right to remain silent, or as I've learned, you can speak your brains out if you know what you're saying. Not all the rights you're going to think you're going to assert. In asking the questions an investigative rec reporter would do to qualify the guy that's in the, author the supposed authority has done everything the courts will be looking that has been done. 
when you go to challenge it. Like the very first point, what can I see this or that, or can I have your name, or what are you doing here? What's the first thing out of your mouth? Leave me alone, go away? No, I wouldn't do any of that. It ought to be, what's your articulable basis for this stop? He's in a uniform. He's got a gun. He's deemed to be an officer of the state. You don't have to inquire any further. There's presumptions working against that him as well. You might as well just write, get right to the point. Now, as soon as you ask an intelligent, on-point question, they have to start in, engaging you. And the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to stick on the fact that the, what's your articulable basis and then just kind of drone on and on and on. I keep moving on what my next, okay, now that I've, now that you haven't articulated that, I go on to the next thing that they're supposed to have that I already know they don't have. I'm looking to make a record and investigate the failure that they have. What's your artic articulable basis? I don't argue with them. I wait to hear it. You don't have one. The law says re that you have to have one. So let the record show that you don't have an articulable basis. I'll be asking you that at the trial. Make sure your report signifies that you didn't tell me an articulable basis. I've just done three more things right there that I, than just making the investigative reporter. I'm actually anticipating the case, which I tell you before. You're working, you're working for your Supreme Court case. A lot of people don't want to hear this. But this is how this is now working on you. And if you expect to survive, you need to do the somewhat of a subtle command and control that they are in, not in control of. And when I see you're under arrest and your state muzzles your rights to speak, not only is it misfocusing mis uh, mis mis uh, focusing the point on the right to speak, which should be actually on the fifth, and whether or not you can speak where it doesn't incriminate you, and what that is that you're saying, and then it says that the state can muzzle you. Those two factors right there are death. And why I found such an issue in this. Okay, lots of setup here. I don't know. Um, wow. Uh, you know, just so much to talk about. Let me read a little bit. And I'm going to get right to the... I can't even get through some of this, folks. There's just so much to talk about. I'm going to go through Gorsuch. Uh, he, he puts in this article, Justice Neil Gorsuch's discussion, dissenting in a case called Nivs Bartlett, and then he makes a statement about the First Amendment. So he focuses under arrest and then the First Amendment. To me, they're not, they're not exclusive, but they're not what you're thinking about. You should be even thinking about it at the time. You're, this is not a First Amendment audit at the point you're under arrest. Not merely detained either, but under arrest. He detained is a time right before arrest. That you're not free to go, and they can hold you while they do an investigation. That's not an arrest. You've got to understand about that, too. Your right to do what you're doing in the First Amendment has nothing to do with what you better be talking to under the Fifth or your right of defense. The right to petition government, we can invoke that a little bit underneath the First. And you're going to hear this limitation. I saw this as an article of focus. It focuses your mind in the wrong ways on the wrong things. And you have to step back and say, but there's more. And you have to know what that is. And a lot of you don't know that. And I know that sounds a little bit arrogant, but I know most of you do not even know how to set a record with a cop at the first point of first contact to set up the defeat, the ability to show the cop had nothing if you survive. And if you do it that way, they also don't usually write the ticket because they realize the record's so screwed up on them, they're going to get caught. See, they do have this thing going on. And it has to do with, I think the last thing we have is this due process. You're focusing your all your investigation on due process and whether it's been comported with, whether they followed it. What's the, the courts say this? Not me. What's the, the court has the cops have to can stop you only upon an articulable basis. You can say it's probable cause. That's what the, that's what the content of the articulable basis is is qualified. And so let me read now Gorsuch's uh, edition in this article from John Whitehead. History shows that governments sometimes seek to regulate our lives finely, acutely, thoroughly, and exhaustively. In our own time and place, criminal laws have grown too exuberantly and come to cover so much previously innocent conduct that almost anyone can be arrested for something. If the state can use these laws, not for their intended purposes, but to silence those to voice unpopular ideas, little would be left of our First Amendment liberties. 
then little would separate us from the tyrannies of the past or the malignant fiefdoms of our own age. The freedom to speak without risking arrest is one of the principal characteristics we could, which, by which we distinguish a free nation, stated as Justice Neil Gorsuch dissenting in Needs vs. Bartlett 2019. Just this year, folks. What's the problem with that statement as applied to the title? That problem, that says it, risk, without risking arrest. The title says, under arrest. And this is the problem with this article, as I read down and saw all the court cases that are applied. Every court case is really not applicable to the point. So be very careful on how you get your information. Let's go on in the article, and now he leads in, now with his own statement, that what the First Amendment protects... And a healthy constitutional republic requires our citizens who routinely exercise their right to speak truth to power. Would you agree with that? Would you agree with it in whole or in part? And in what part? And what about not agreeing because it was not the right part? Can we say that's a truism? Sure, I guess we could say the First Amendment protects a citizen who routinely exercises the right to speak truth to power. But as an arrest, that's not really what's going on at the point of that condition. And what's the other problem right up front? What the First Amendment protects, and then he mentions the right to speak truth to power. Folks, sit back a little bit. Do any of you, most, does most of you, I hope, understand that the First Amendment speaks to more than just the right to speak truth, not to power, just to freedom of speech? Do you know that the First Amendment is not minimized to this statement. And let's go look, if you hadn't understood it. And a lot of, I don't necessarily remember all these either, but there's very few people that can recite not just the freedom of speech, but there's other things in the First Amendment. He doesn't touch on those. So he's focused, he's a, have a myopic view of what he's talking about. And then he says, that this is during an arrest, you're going to speak truth to power. Folks, I'm here to tell you, no, you're not. You're there to figure out all the things you can do as an, uh, to investigate and to collect all the information of the failures of the guy that's pretending to be a cop. And you're there to qualify that he's there lawfully. He might be there, I don't know. And this is the, there's always that fine gray line, but you're there to get that evidence. You're not there to speak truth to power. I'll tell you, by doing this, you're speaking the truth to power. The truth that they were involved, that they were wrong. You don't do it because you think you're walking out of a position of truth to power. Under arrest, that's going to be a legal, whether you like legal or not, or law, that's going to be an obligation of yours to meet. Just for yourself, first of all, self-preservation, and then your, your defense in the future. And potent, potentially a, a remedy, however, whatever those end up being. So, Let's read that First Amendment. He said that this, what did he say? i could go back over there real quick. Now, the First Amendment protects. Didn't he say that? He said the First Amendment protects, and then he lists the right to speak truth to power. I want you to see whether or not in the First Amendment it has the phrase, the right to speak truth to power. But if it doesn't have that, then he's misdirecting people. And if, he only, and if there's more, he's misdirecting people. And I don't even... Part of me gets what he's saying. He's telling you some very important things here. But he's, my view and experience says he's walking everybody into a mental cul-de-sac. And on the inside of that cul-de-sac is a guy waiting with a, whether it's a gun or the force of government to come and beat on you or allow others to come in and beat on you. That is the cul-de-sac you don't want to walk into. Here's what the First Amendment says. And I want you to listen very carefully whether or not the right to speak truth to power is in here. Or if it's a, if it's just an implied part, minimal, minimized part. And there's much, much more that he should have actually stated. And in that regard, he should have rephrased his sentence. He should have expanded this to what the right would actually do and then lead you into, notwithstanding it appears that there's a muzzle going on, this is what you can do with this. This is what it really is. Why? Because unless you assert this, they are going to run you down. So to my mind, I started seeing this is the victim attitude, or this is the instruction to be a victim. And in my experience, if you don't take control 
part, part control of the communication that's going on at the moment that they're about ready to shoot you and expand the time you need to be able to respond and put questions in the mind and in the oral record that determine the dialogue between the two of you without argument on point you will not have the time in order to stop the bullet from coming out if you do this you expand the time and you will likely be able to interfere with that that trigger finger and I don't know what, how to prove this to you it's just how I've seen it work if you can't rationalize that they take command of us, they're trained to take command of a situation, and if you insert the stick in their spokes that you're in, fen you're in fact not arguing but inserting a defense, questioning their authority to be in your face the right way, not as an argument, that's enough timing that that might release, that might sever that trigger finger from that gun. That's how serious it's gotten. It used to be so much better. I mean, I've, I've been in a, in a walk around uh, non-wrestling mess. You remember, you can't resist the rest uh, with a cop. Tried to want to arrest me. Well, uh, somehow I have the ability just to stay away from without making it violent. And so there was no really resisting arrest, but the guy couldn't really arrest me until I allowed it. But I, before I allowed it, I made sure there was an oral record between us that he was making stuff up. Now, there's ways you can contort, slowly contort your body so that you're not underneath their pressure. I tend to be able to do that. I'm pretty flexible. Well, I used to be anyway. Don't want to, I don't want to test that no more. But there's ways that they can do their finger holds, and you just go with it. But, but all the energy starts going on them, and, I, and I'm asking questions the whole time. Not, not, not stupid questions. I'm asking what their basis is, essentially, until I get it, and then I move on. Once they tell me they don't have it, then I've also got them, psychologically I've got them, because now they're making uh, wrongful impositions. I'm looking for the articulable basis, and it makes no sense I can question that. In other words, how did you come with that? How did you come up with this? Are we making this up? And now I've got this. I wouldn't have had it then. I have it now. So you're taking your color of authority. As soon as they said they didn't have one or couldn't actually articulate the right one or articulated an incorrect one, I would say, so you're using the color of your authority to extort or coerce me, uh, extort my property or coerce my rights. That's a felony. I would turn right around there, gain more distance in time on his brain or her brain. I'm not arguing with them. I'm asking a question that's really not a question. I'm establishing a law. Why? Because I've read and I've read it in the black and white, and they've read the black and white, and their certification reads the black and white. It's all said that they have to follow that. Is that a complete shield? Absolutely not, and don't think it is. Don't argue with these people. So, let's go to the First Amendment. What's in the First Amendment? Is it uh, the right to speak truth to power? Article Amendment 1, Amendment to the Original Constitution, Congress shall Congress. Does that say state? And now, aren't you, aren't you glad for the 14th Amendment? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and, the petition, the, and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. How many, how many rights are you seeing protected there? One? First of all, even if it's... If, if the, did you hear the right to, to speak truth to power there? Not really in the way that's specifically stated, did you? But you do have the freedom of speech and the right to petition government. So you should be stating those two things. But that's not one thing, isn't it? It's two. And so for him to pigeonhole this down into something that's not even in the First Amendment, which as an attorney he should be promoting all the time, so you know where the source of authority is, not as an argument, not as some whining, not as a big complaint of how what a thug the officer is, but to establish what you're, where you're looking at, you'll find out nothing in there says right to remain silent, does it? Nothing in there talks about arrest, does it? No, because it's not what you're talking about here. But it's not just the right to speak truth to power as a right. Those are all misstatements, and it's not just one, it's what? Respecting the establishment of religion, one. Prohibiting the, re, the, the free exercise of it. That's a corollary right. So one and, and the corollary. And that brings up the next others that we have. Corollary rights that are not mentioned that we can still uh, rely on. Abiding a, a free speech, two. Or of the, the press, three. Now, the press is an interesting addition. If all of free speech was okay, then why did they make a special carve-out, if you will, for press? I think 
opinion here, but I think that's the commerce side of free speech. And remember, the, con the Constitution says Congress can regulate commerce. And so they carved out the commerce part of free speech, that marketplace of ideas, if you will, if you please, with the way the contortions of the Supreme Court have made it, and they've carved out the com commercial free speech was protected here. The press. Three, the right of the people to peacefully assemble. Four, and five, the peti to petition the government for redress of grievance. That wasn't supposed to be a hollow thing, folks. That was supposed to be a substantial thing that actually does something, not just I get to complain and they get to receive the petition and then say throw it in the round file. Let's go back to the right to peace of, peace of the assembly. Uh, they have the right to establish religion, the prohibition against the free exercise. Um, well, I guess those are two different things. One establish and one, one to exercise the establishment. But it's always been interpreted if you do something, you have the corollary rights to pertinences to go do that. Uh, so they can't prohibit, though, I guess is the point I'm focusing on. In other words, so we can do the establishment or the prohibition against the exercise. You can't. You have the right in the free, let's go to free, peaceful assembly is a similar thing in the free exercise thereof. They carved out separately as different, but you have the right of peaceful assembly. You also have the right to be left alone. You have the right to be from an assembly of people. And so we can use those corollary rights as the way I'm talking that show that even if we look at the other parts of the First Amendment, you certainly are not muzzled, are you? Even if this was after an arrest, and if you have properly applied these with these words instead of your opinion, you would be able to lead everything you did in conversation with a point of first contact in a cop and uh, evidencing self-evidently that you are not muzzled at all. And the idea that you're muzzled after, or the, or the government can muzzle you after, is really just a bunch of choices that you're making to allow a tyrant, the tyrant he says exists, to go ahead and be that tyrant. And this is, again, I tell you, stop being that victim. You, you have to assert the rights that you have. You have to assert the remedies. You have to have a word in your mouth, as I reduce it down to try and tell you behind the woodshed. Have a word in your mouth. It has to be these words. It has to be, if you're going to use the First Amendment, I would have a whole lot more to say than I've got the right to speak truth to power, cop. What's he going to do? He's going to prove how much I don't have it. Why? Because I've missed the point. I missed the point that there's a carve-out for them to go ahead and be in my face, violate the first. And at that point, I only have a couple of other things down the road a ways, like maybe the right to remain silent or the right of a defense, the right to establish a defense, the right to inquire upon an, Ill an unlawful act, make a record of it. I have the right of due process here again. Totally different than the First Amendment. And so... Did, did that, was that an accurate summary? Only in the first, his first entry on that article, he says that the First Amendment protects the right to speak truth to power. Did you hear that at all in there? Maybe as a construction, but did you hear those words in that amendment? You have to, I hope you're honest enough to say no. So he's misguiding us here. As much as, as he's telling us some good stuff, I don't think Whitehead's a bad guy. I just, this is just how, People communicate, and I find it's wrong, and it's dangerous for you all. But we could quibble on how. I guess we could get in a dialogue about how this was about, what the focus is, but that's a problem. That's a dialogue. That's not, that dialogue's not going to help you. These, uh, these equivocations or these uh, apparent oxymorons that may be, uh, may be able to resolve with further discussion are not going to be the discussion in your mind when you're faced with these problems. And you believe someone like this that says that your rights are muzzled and they're only the First Amendment right to treat, speak truth, truth, truth to power. Like he's saying like that's what you want to do in the first point of first contact of an arrest. Nonsense, folks. Absolute nonsense. You don't want to speak truth to power. You'll speak truth to power by exposing they had no power. If you can. And that's the problem. The if is always your question. They create the if. I said don't walk in when you can't, when you, don't walk into a condition where there's an if. Don't make a question. They force it on you. You're not free of that forced association. So, that's a violation of the First Amendment if you can create the, the assembly of that, that they've forced, has no lawful bearing and existence. And you'll notice the court cases in this, argue, this article will relate to that very decision of the court saying that, that 
that uh, this article says is a violation of free speech when in fact it was that the cops created at least the facial articulable basis of probable cause to be doing what they were doing and someone encroached that. And that's not defensible and it doesn't give you a harm. And then you'll see the distinction that I've been telling you when you read this article and you start analyzing what's actually being talked about. He's talking about after arrest and he talks about the First Amendment and he limits the First Amendment. If you think that, you're going to be in some trouble in the future. When you're under arrest, you better be thinking, investigative reporter, I need a defense and I better get it out fast. I don't mean talk fast. I mean get the points and elements that the courts have said that the cop has to have. You have to go read them. There's about three to five of them. First is probable cause that's the most important. That's probably the one you want to focus on. And, and I, I talk about others because I've found as you keep needling down, you can keep getting more and more down into where they cannot even create a plausible. Uh, uh, you're defeating the plausible deniability of their ignorance. And that's the other thing they give to the cops that we complain about. They can even be ignorant of law. That's the first thing you're putting. First, I want to know why you're in my face lawfully, and then what was the proper application of the law that you're now imposing? In other words, the probable cause, of, well, you were light tail light was let out. What's the probable cause for that relative to my rights to do here? They won't have an answer. But here's what I, let me say it more or less. Less esoteric. If they were to catch me, and when they do, I say, what does that have to do relative to my right under the road law? And I give them the citation where the where you don't have jurisdiction, but the county does, and they can infringe this right. Where is you, this, this charge relative to that right that's in me by Congress is my answer to them. I ask them a pretty long-winded question in a way with three clauses that they'll never understand, folks. What did I just get on the, on the record? I got on the record he's, in a to he's applying a totally different law than what he should be to me. Can I argue with him then about the veracity of that? No, but I can work toward the future. But when I put it out that way, he now has to think about something. Did he just screw up? Because I just got knowledge enough to be able to show him a pathway where he's not correct. Does he want to waste time with me is the other question that goes into his mind. What have I just done? Maybe his trigger finger just got a little weaker. Maybe it come off the pe Maybe it's come off. Maybe he's not worried about things. I'm talking to him intelligently. He's not looking for me to be uh, some gangster now that he thought he was going to make me out to be. Is this all foolproof? Again, forget foolproof. Forget shields. They get real ornery and they get real upset. And you have to go with the flow and you have to move to the next place that they move in order to move ahead of where they are and anticipate where they're going. If they get angry, you have to use that angry on the... So you're getting angry instead of telling me your articulate basis. Did they train you to do that? Now what am I doing? My question to them, the, my, my point and my response to that is I'm now talking toward a certification and the sufficiency of it at the state level. You, do people even think this far ahead? You have to anymore because you're going to die if you don't in a lot of times. So... I mean, I've anticipated this for decades. How, how I'm talking to you right now is I'm just making up something. In my head, oh, and yeah, that's hypothetical. But I'm making up, what do I do? And that's not like even so hypothetical. I've, I've done this stuff when I've been stopped and things. And it's on all kinds of subject matters. So I'm not talking to you uh, just hyper, hyperbolic here. There's a requirement. You have to go to what the courts will be allowing to the cops, and you have to make a record that can't, tries to defeat that in them. And then you have to have the secondary part where they try to put on something that's not applicable to you, and your defense is you operate in a totally different jurisdiction. But while I say that, it reminds me to remind, uh, did, did you all understand when I talked about migrants yesterday, that you're not trying to actually be a migrant. You're trying to make a record as the migrants do in order to be able to pass through. They end up looking the same. The status is completely different, but the look, your foreignness to that jurisdiction is the same. So if you missed that subtlety, please do not try to be the migrant. What you're trying to do is have your, your, your record look like a migrant. They're treated the same. So, okay, so here we go. That's what I just said. And when I was, uh, you, you wanted to, oh, your tail light was that. Well, what is that, how is that relevant to my to this law and this statute that gives the county the right, not you, exclusive to the county, and wasn't supposed to interfere with me the way you have. 
is my response to their so-called articulable basis. I have to know the next step, folks. This is a chess game at some level, but it's real-time danger. And so do, am I, okay, so am I sounding muzzled as I tell you this is how I would respond? Again, it's a hypothetical condition, and we wouldn't know the reality at the point. We just do what we can do, and when I try to focus your mind to do certain things a certain way, I think it'll get you through better a lot quicker. Are you hearing that I am muzzled at all? I know I talk a lot. No, I'm talking, let's listen to what I'm saying specific to that encounter. Do you hear that I'm, I'm lost for words or I've been bound down or gagged? Do you hear that I've been shut down? I hope you can hear there is a thing to say. Have I incriminated myself, folks? This is the, really the most incredible thing that, that I finally uh, became, uh, showed myself in reading enough. Have I incriminated myself at all in anything I said in my interactions to his to that co officer's or, or code enforcement officer's assertion? I haven't shut up yet, folks. Have you heard? And look at I've got such a pile of stuff that they have to go through that are the things I'm going to be relying upon and making record for in the first instance of contact. Have I been muzzled? Absolutely. I hope you see it's absolutely not. Would you have come up with that? Well, I don't know that many of you would, and I'm asking you to. Tune it up, folks. This is what, to, how, and it's not that hard. I guess it sounds like a lot, but it's not that hard. Literally, go. You can read this. This article would be good to show you what the. If you go through and see the the court cases he he provides, look at those court cases of what the court actually decided, and you'll find out that in every case that the cops are given the right, they were able to sustain the probable cause to be doing a lawful action where they were, and someone intruded upon that without a good reason. The only one that I found interesting, but he doesn't speak about it, at the very end of this article, is about another lawyer, I think it was in Pennsylvania, who remained silent and got in trouble. Now, that's the case I'm interested in. Is that First Amendment, though? No, it's a Fifth Amendment case. And so you got to read, if you read carefully, this thing is all really disjointed, and it's, it seemed to me to be a misin a mispresentation, a bad promotion to you all, anybody who reads it or anybody who wants to learn more about this stuff. I looked at this as a how you don't go argue something, how you don't tell what you don't tell people to do, what you don't pigeonhole their minds to, what you all need to start opening and expanding your minds from. He's an attorney. Well, he, what do you know is what I always get. What do you, what's your legal training? Who cares? I'm talking about the law, not legal, first of all. Secondly, you can go do the research and find out whether or not what I'm saying is correct or not. That's up to you anyway. Qualify this stuff. Don't even listen to me. I hope you can hear the veracity with my st my statements. When I said that's a First Amendment, he's talking First Amendment. I said your right to remain silent in a in a in an arrest is a Fifth Amendment thing. Do you have a right to defend yourself? Absolutely. So it's not you're not muzzled. The first not has nothing to do with the First Amendment. It has to do with the right of a defense and preparing a defense and due process underneath the Fourth Amendment. If you were to pull all this stuff out, I don't even really... Did you hear me say in my response, I'm talking about a Fourth Amendment right or a Fifth Amendment right or a fifth, uh, Eighth Amendment, Seventh, whatever. No, I'm talking about the statutes that he's been trained under, that he wants to bring a traffic code onto me, and if I'm traveling underneath the highway law, I've got a whole string of laws that he, he I already know that he doesn't know that he's going to be obligated to. Now, you haven't heard yet what I was going to do with that, have you? So not only do I have potential of getting a citation, I'm going to be looking to make a defense in my record at the first point of first contact, which I can sit him on the stand and I can ask all these questions of him. I can eliminate his ignorance and his, certif and his certification and the sufficiency of it. I can even give him an out, but then I show the whole state is not certified correctly. Why is that important? Because then I'm going to run over on my equity side and I'm going to do an, an equity injunction against him for for all the things I found out he did wrong. Now that's a whole lot other step, but do you understand how they've got us locked in? If you're not willing to come up to this level of integration, you may die one day, folks, I guess, and I don't want to sound fear-mongering. This is the day. We're living in that day. You don't have a word in your mouth that's on point and proper. You don't disconnect that figure, trigger finger from from the from that monkey uh, that, that creature that you can be too smart to be a cop, uh, be a cop and ha too psychologically stable. You don't disconnect that trigger, that that baton uh, uh, the, or, or taser finger action. You may not survive. 
And it's not that fear free. Once you get into a mindset, it's just dealing. It's a factual. It's just another. They're just doing their job. Treat it like that. They might say that. Well, I'm just doing my job. Well, I'm not asking about your job. I'm asking about your duty. And what have I done now? I'm back to their certification. I'm back to the law. I'm back to their oath. Am I talking about that? No, but that's what I'm talking about for later. I'm not asking about his oath of office. I expect that he took it. I presume he's took it, taken it. I presume he's a lawful, but legally before me, but in an unlawful manner. I perfect that in just short words. I'm getting kind of excited because a lot of people maybe don't think this is important, and a lot of people are dying anymore. And I think it's partly from listening to people like this now that I've actually got kind of irritated about this article that I wasn't last week. Maybe I should have done it. It would have been a little bit smoother. But there's so much that's uh, focusing you on the wrong things and not explaining, more importantly, not explaining. This is an attorney. I can't call him a lawyer now. He's an attorney. He's attorning something. He's got a book to sell. He's telling you enough of the truth of the danger, but he's not offering how to counter it. I'm not call it, saying I'm better. I'm saying that my experience says when I'm involved with this, I'm not muzzled at all. In fact, if I'm muzzled, that's my problem. i got to figure out a way. My, it may, my life may depend on me properly not unmuzzling myself if they've done that. If I go to the right to remain silent and I say silent, do you understand I haven't made the things I could speak around about that didn't incriminate me? And this is To me, that was a revelation, folks. Endless speaking without causing inflammation of the condition and establishing your rights and establishing your defense, never shutting up, but never incriminating yourself. If you get that, you'll understand how to walk through a lot of this stuff. It changes. You have to think totally different. For you on the street meeting your friends, it means nothing. For all you all want to continue to meet with your friends, all you all independently, are going to, non-dependently, maybe both, independently to keep coming around with and visiting each other because assemble yourself, or non-dependently when you're just wanting to be on your own, you all have to figure this out. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of our folks, a lot of our f friends, a lot of stories coming now where the, uh, the so-called tyrant is existent without any measure of constraint. Now, he talks, goes into that. So, let me, that's the first, okay, a lot of discussion on the First Amendment. He constrained it. I'm telling you, you, you have the right to, you're not muzzled, and you have the duty to, to defend yourself to speak. They can't muzzle you. And if you say the correct things, they won't be able to muzzle you, and they can't, they will not perceive it as something that you're just, uh, you're arguing with them, is the point. You don't make it a position of a power struggle. That's the last thing you want to do. I mean, come and think. You got to think, think intelligently here. If it behooved me to shut up, you're going to hear me behoove, but shut up. As soon as I hear that there's an opportunity, I'm going to be speaking no non-incriminating things that set a record, that cause a question, and I'm not going to try and outsmart him. It's easy, but you don't want to. That's a power struggle. Then you just bring something. Collect, you bring a third party, that written word that lots of people will deny is lawful, legal even. You bring the third party objective basis, that black and white, in as a witness. You do not challenge the authority directly. That authority will kill you. That's a power. The power of life and death. And if you've ever heard that before, right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, he goes on to say in this article, What the architects of the police state want are submissive, compliant, cooperative, obedient, meek citizens who don't talk back, don't challenge government authority, don't speak out against government misconduct, and don't step out of line. Well, that's true. But what has he done? He said you're muzzled at the point of arrest. And he's gonna, and they're a tyrant to do that, and you're helpless because of all these other wrongs. Let me go back up to this, uh, the thing about what he says. What the First Amendment protects and a healthy constitutional republic requires are citizens routinely exercising their right to speak truth to power. Even if that was true, and he's complaining that it doesn't exist, then you're not living in that constitutional republic, correct? So then what's your complaint? You either do something about it, or you don't have the constitutional republic expectation. Stop your whining. And yet I tell you, no, it's not like that at all. It sits there to re-invoke if you know how to do that. And each one of you has to do that if you want to not, to not be what he says, 
the, the arch, architects of the police state want? How does it feel to want? If you're doing it properly, if you're never incriminating yourself on an on an almost incessant amount of, of information going on. You ask your question, shut up and let the answer come. When the answer comes, you then jump on the answer in a way that you find you can move it to say it was inadequate. You're moving to the next step. Uh, the next step was all the things that he was supposed to do that he never did do and couldn't do. Because you're developing in your so-called migrant status the record that shows that he had no right, uh, he had no right to interfere with you. Now, there can be plausible uh, suspicion you have to defeat that, but you can't argue with them on it. You have to go down the nuts and bolts about how they would have made that determination. All they're looking to do is qualify, make a plausible condition that they had right to be in your face. That's all they need to establish. Your job, if you wish to step up and learn how to do it, is to eliminate that from them. And that, I've found, causes enough dis distance that you may not be the next uh, news story about the next victim that was put on their knees and shot by 15 officers with AR-15s because you were suspicious. And folks that are of color, <laughs> well, you're all colored folks. You don't realize all that. That's the, those of you that want to take the status under the 14th Amendment, notwithstanding the power of the 14th Amendment against the states to help us, uh, we're all colored, colored folks. We're all colored persons. We're colored by the law that would impose these things. And until you figure that one out, that we're all colored persons, you're not going to quite get also what's going on. The other thing is those people of color, please, please be very careful because you do have a bigger target. You're not going to do it by sounding stupid, though, or sounding feeding into their expectation. You have even a higher those of any, I don't care where you go in this country, whatever the prejudice, the ethnic prejudice is in that, it could be just white trash. The next traffic cop looking for that, that the bomba going down the road. It doesn't matter your color, because you're all colored. It matters what the mind of the, the trust pad, the tyrant, has made you out to be in a, in a pre discriminatory manner. You can't speak to that. You have to expose it the way I'm insane. You will be targeted wherever you are, no matter what you are, by, uh, in this classless society, the class that the cops have put you in. It used to be degrade mentalities that respected people of means. Somewhere in the last decade, that got eliminated. And I think the war of terror against us kind of had something to do with that. The wraps were pulled off. Getting back to the story here. So they want an architect. The, the police say, want you this way. This article, I think, sells you into that submission. I'm asking you to think more about what I'm saying. Think about it. Don't just take it. Think about it. Put it in your mind to discuss in your own mind how this all works, how it, how, what, what I'm saying relative to what needs to happen, what you've seen. Apply what I said to the, even the court cases, he says, and apply them strictly about the, what the court's looking at, not what he's talking about, that this is evidence of the tyranny. This is evidence of the muzzling. Because a lot of those court cases, uh, well, one, the last one I was interested in didn't have a, didn't come to a conclusion. The other ones, if you look, they strictly finding the if. If the cop had probable cause and the right, even a lawful duty to be there and helping, you better not interfere. And, and these third party interferences are likely failures. That isn't you, the state causing a muzzling. At least the way the system is set up. And so, uh, apply what I'm saying to this, and I think you'll find out this is really not a very, uh, the, uh, the authorship here wants to tell you stuff. He's telling you the truth. The architects do want meek citizens. But to say that the, uh, but the First Amendment is only one thing and it's not the thing that was stated is not helping you. To not then inform you that there's a, these cases that he lists are evidences of how you don't do it isn't helping you. And he's the attorney who, uh, who ought to be telling you. So that I don't have to face the scrutiny of, well, what do you know? You're just the guy behind the woodshed. Now, that's not an excuse for you either. You have to go find the veracity of this truth, well, whoever has it. Well, going on and reading a little bit more. And so I took, <laughs> this is going to take a lot longer than I thought, as usual. I guess I shouldn't have read the, doc the document last night because it just I just realized what it didn't affect me because I was looking more neutrally and more like the guys, you know, anybody is just uh, telling people there's a bad way here, folks. We need to step up. 
you're living in an environment that you need to change. But he doesn't really tell you that you need to change it or how. He actually pigeonholes you, as I read the second time through, and I found out, wait a minute, this is really a lot worse uh, of a constraint on people's minds and guidance uh, than, than I had thought before. Yes, it's explaining a condition. He keeps using the police state. I tell you, it's a military. And we're going to get down to where he starts using those words. But he doesn't really go there. And I think it's absolutely imperative to go there. Because I told you, if you look into the military side of this, the imposition, however they try to keep it the spaghetti western that you live in, uh, the, you address it through there, the most constrained condition, and you come out a lot better, a lot faster. And you address those things that were the immunities were given. You start eliminating those in the, in the uh, reporting. It's not a dialogue. It's not an argument. You're, you, uh, sub, uh, you can always preface your statement uh, in, de, in preparing your defense, at the, uh, the future defense against the citation. I need to know this. You preface, you have a better word in your mouth than to argue or say how much rights you have or, or ask questions like, am I free to go? That, that's really not, not a, it used to be a thing. Before the cops and the judges and everybody got the answer, I told you, as they get the answer, you have to move into the more uh, substantial place in, in the black and white in order to protect yourself. Well, he goes on here. For, for those who refuse to meekly accept the heavy-handed tyranny of, of the police state, the danger is all too real. Folks, the danger is all too real, period. I've just explained to you a condition, a response condition, where... You're not meekly accepting any heavy-handed tyranny. And so he's doing a twisted thing here. If you come and meekly accept the heavy-handed, the dangerous alternative, yes. That's all of you all, likely. I haven't seen that, though, because I'm not coming at it meekly, as he says in here, like you, you're going to be coming as some subservient uh, a victim. What if you come properly in not accepting and challenging properly? I have a heavy-handed tyranny of any official, whether that police, military, or just lawful de jour instruction. And if you hear me say that, I hope you understand that there's a thread, a fine line, there's a narrow path you take. that It speaks to all the excesses. And again, does that make you uh, impervious? Are you Teflon? No. There's no shield between you and that trigger finger and that bullet or the baton, or the taser. There's no shield. What you apparently, I can see you do, would be you're apparently dealing with the mentality that's behind that trigger finger. And they have some real liability until they can make a record that shows that they aren't liable. And your job is not to argue with that, to expose that they are liable without challenging that. And you do it by what I've been saying. You do it by making the proper request of them that the courts have said you need to follow. You go look at their certification, what it's supposed to do, and you then go to the statutes and you read, let's say like in the one, one state, that's a, the state trooper has to honor a certain rights. You go look at that statement. You should have that in a bag of law that you have on a card even. And if the state trooper that stops you and he's going to violate your rights, you lead with that. He's not his, but he says an articulable basis. But he said, but you're not supposed to violate this statute relative to my rights. And then you run over to where your right is. So you're violating this. So are, then I now know to say a third, fourth step, which is, are you using your color of authority to interfere with this property and right over here that I'm granted by Congress to do? Did I say it was my right? Did I say it was just made up by me? Did I say that this is a constitutional thing? No, I put a lineage of the title I've, in law that I have that shows that he was not supposed to trespass this point that I'm saying was these conditions. Is a much better word in your mouth and pulls that trigger finger away, that finger away from the trigger and disconnects the mind to it than you saying, I have a right to drive, I have a right to travel, am I detained? Well, any of this other stuff I hear. I guess we're, I said we're having to up the game here in order to keep ourselves safe. And I'm saying you have then the uh, two things you're doing. Making a defense in your cases, making a defense against some civil action, administrative thing, and also creating the remedy at the same time. All at the point of first contact. Am I, does I sound to you, whether you can do this or not, whether you would say the same thing I would or not, do you, would we, those of us that would say, do we sound muzzled by the First Amendment? Do we sound muzzled by the tyrant in front of us? 
I can't believe that you would come to the conclusion that, that anybody like myself or me in that condition is. If you would be, you're one of the co cooperative, obedient, meek citizens that he's talking about that the police state wants you to exist. And I'm saying do this in all the fair, in all um, respect, even though there's maybe no respect to be given. You're qualifying a condition. It's this boundary, it's this tenuous line between your rights and what the state wants to do to destroy them. And despite that ongoing war, we're supposed to be doing it civilly. Okay, well, that's because, why? Because we don't have the power. We don't have the gun that's going to be justified to take you out. So you better learn the reality. Let me go on and read some more. Because here's where the words come up with the truth. Instead of police state, we start finding out, well, why are they doing this? When it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and lays eggs like a duck, maybe it's a duck, folks. I mean, let's just call it what it is. And I think, for me... When I did that, it, it gave me actually more power because I could go right to the be, uh, the more confining source was actually a, a, a it's kind of odd it's a freeing condition because I can now be focused on if I can dis dismantle the most constrained shackles right before their eyes done properly then there's no other shackles that they can put on me there's nothing more con constraining than they could do to me and this is not a fight we're in a war but this is not a fight. And if you make a fight, you're making an issue, they have the power to beat you. And so you put it on them, the, 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 the discrepancies within their believed lawful action that they think they can rely upon, you destroy that, because the courts have given that. You have to destroy that. Don't, don't think that, the, even though the, you think the courts are invalid, that those guys aren't working underneath that. They're using these, these things that, that Whitehead describes as a, as, a, as a violation to the people. They're using that as a license to harm you. You have to disarm that. You have to take that away from them. The only way I know to do that is the proper understanding of what the parameters are they're dealing with, what they were supposed to do, knowing how they did it wrong, and bringing the answer of what they should have done right back to them as the question. And then I add now that that's a color of authority felony if it attaches a property or right of extortion or coercion. Do I sound, again, do I sound muzzled, folks? No, in fact, the arrest invokes the requirement to start speaking correctly. Otherwise, what? I can condemn myself. I, I did, again, I, I, I kind of laugh in my mind. Isn't it amazing? I can literally not shut up at the point of the time I have the right to remain silent and never incriminate myself. Have you ever thought about that? In and before a cop, on point discussion, not talking about the trees and the bunnies and the clouds and the, you know, the elephants and the clouds and the, and, the, and the DWEWs and all this other, the Constitution. No, talking directly on the point of the matter, directly on the face of the danger, standing right in front of the pikes and laughing at them through the words used by the fact that I'm setting up an objective basis of how they're wrong. Never shutting up because there's so much to develop as far as the record. And giving time for a conversation and having a calm, a serene, creating a calm, you want to calm that down. But bringing every statement you have is on point and never shutting up at the point of, a sta of the statement you're making is never incriminating except against him, her, or the system itself. And when I realized that, I realized part of the game. The right to remain silent could be a trap. He's talking about your right to speak being infringed. He's hitting the other side of that. If you think you're muzzled, in your mind, you go in with your mind that they're muzzling you because they're a tyrant, you think. You aren't working the law in order to find that they are not having any authority and not making a record for yourself. He goes on to say, we live in the age when we the people are at the mercy of militarized, weaponized, immunized cops who have almost absolute discretion Almost absolute discretion to decide who is a threat, what constitutes resistance, and how harshly they can deal with the citizens they were appointed to, quote, serve and protect. Wow, folks, I hope you hear how to analyze that. He just described the duck. It's the military. Weaponized, militarized, immunized. What is that? That's Libra code, folks. Almost absolute discretion. Did you hear the equivocation, the hesitation there, folks? That's the small path I'm telling you to enter on. The almost absolute discretion. You destroy 
their discretion. You don't argue with them. You don't destroy it like some physical act. You move the record, oral record, in through the discussion of the first, first point of first contact. They determine, and he gives you the list, and there's a couple others, and the courts will tell you what this is. It's not even not, it's all out there for us to learn. We just choose not to learn. Yes, apathy is real. Yes, lots of talk, people like to talk about all the rights they have, but not assertive. Everyone wants to talk about rights that they'll never be able to assert as well, and they won't assert the lesser, uh, the lesser forms of action that would keep them from having to as well. We're really a dysfunctional system, a societal system and a people within it. But he says it here, he's telling you a truth here. He doesn't recognize it. He says it a police state. I'm telling you, he says it. He's defined the military. And the military determines almost to absolute discretion. And that's where you go in, where the almost is. It's where you put your crowbar to pry that tyrannical limpet and parasitical limpet off its rock. But he's, going to, he's saying what constitutes resistance, how harshly they can deal with citizens they were appointed to serve and protect. Well, they decide to threat. Don't be the threat. Learn how not to be the threat. Learn how to make a record so they can't make a plausible um, statement on a report that makes you a threat. They can still lie, but I'm talking about surviving, putting the question in their mind so they don't pull the trigger or beat the baton on you to the point that you're dead or whatever the heck they want to do to make it so you don't have the next day. That's the first thing. What they put in the report that's false is going to be proven contrary by your record the made that you make. And so that's dealt with a little bit differently and not at the same time. But what constitutes resistance? Remember I told you, I can kind of get in a dance with a cop and not be resistant. It's what, partly what I'm saying. I'm not saying for you to do this. And I'm not saying I do this as everything. But when there's a situation when I'm going to be hurt, I found out my body goes into this really interesting dance, if you will. And people, I noticed, took a little issue. This is a dance. They don't like the word dance, I guess. And yet I won't be found for resistance, and I won't be beat down to the point where I'm hurt. No, I don't interact, engage with the cops. It's past history when... Didn't know better, traveling around, and it was susceptible to the cops to the point where they pulled the gun and wanted to shoot me, and then somehow I survived. All that was out there. All right? I've seen, been involved with all kinds of little interactions here and there. Didn't realize what I was up against. But there's a way to not resist, and it all partly in, in making that record. And as long as they don't have a record about the arrest, they don't have a particular basis, there's a question of whether you're under arrest. And if you can get that out, then they can't be resisting. Why? Because he has to have a lawful, a lawful reason to be in your face and do you give you lawful orders. If you don't, if you have a question on how you attach that. So, we live in a weaponized, we the people, at the mercy of militarized. Well, then you're an occupied people, folks, if you're at the mercy. And yet it's almost, it's almost, it's almost complete, it's absolute, except for almost. Oh. Who they determine to be a threat and what constitutes resistance. And I say, learn what the courts have given the license to these cops to do and defeat that with your words relative to how I said it earlier in the last hour, how to do that. Then he says that they were appointed to serve and protect. Folks, a military serves and protects itself. So his whole concepting of what this is is incorrect. Whether he's promoting... Um, knowingly mispromoting this or doesn't hasn't quite put the put the points together close enough. If he hasn't, you can't listen to this guy anyway. But if he's a player in it and he's moving the agenda and remember we sued the bar so the Jefferson Money District sued the bar association as one of the players. Their members are part of the players. I'm always looking for the bar member that's going to be different, but they always seem to do fall short in an objective way, not not in my opinion of it. Clearly, against the objective basis. But if he looks at this, he defined that you're under military occupation, and then he says that they were served to protect and thinks that, uh, thinks that saying that is it to protect the citizen, this guy is misguided. And I want you to take note of that for yourself, whether or not I would worry about calling him names over it, I don't think so. But this is just a writing, and this is what he's trying to pretend, uh, pretend to say. But uh, right there, that one paragraph tells me he doesn't understand the condition. And if he does, he's a player. He's, a, he's, a, he's an officer in that military. And he's selling you down the river, which makes it even more important for you to listen to what I'm saying about this. Again, don't do anything without doing some study. I mean, you've got to really do this. This is not really a, an aggressive action. This is really, you got to, I'm, there's no... You keep this up on a tension level, 
with a guy that's got a gun, you're at, you're forget it, you're done. You're asking for trouble. You got to what deescalate the condition. And the way I found you do that is you start bringing your objective basis, not your opinion of it, but the way it, it's stated and how they have been given license to act through it. You have to defeat that. The almost part is the critical statement in him telling you you're before a, a, a military occupation. His, mis, his mis imputation to your mind that they're there to serve and protect you is, 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 is certainly can't be qualified by the evidence. And yet he still say, he still makes the, an assumption that they're, they're to serve and protect the term citizens, which are subjects. Well, the subjects to what? Those officers work for that, not, not the serfs, not the peasants, not the uh, subjects. Subject. Then he goes on to say, as such, to those who seek or exercise their First Amendment rights during encounters with police are increasingly finding that there is no such thing as freedom of speech. Folks, he's talking, what, before the arrest, isn't he? So that's not even really relevant to his title. For those of you, for, and I'm not even really talking to First Amendment auditors, but that just came to mind, and there are some listening. And again, thank you for all, all the rebroadcasts and stuff that you do, and all the, the chats that are out there. I, I was able to go see one, and lots of come communicating on it. Thank you very much for, for integra integrating with all this, and hopefully we'll get you all working into a better thought and how to do things better. And we'll get, this is just on the encounter side. There's so much of these same techniques that we would use when we were moving against a problem, like in policy considerations and or getting the government to comport itself to objective basis and other areas before it even gets here. This is what I'm hoping you, you guys will step up and forget. I mean, in a way, you don't have to, you make a future in the world. You work toward that this doesn't become the problem that it has become, or it, it eliminates this potential even within the military consequence. He said almost dis absolute discretion. I can't tell you how most, he should have actually just highlighted and underlined that. But see, he's not here to tell you how to do much or that there might be uh, the opportunity. That is a savings clause, I would put it in those terms. Almost absolute discretion is what I'm telling you to hone in on. That's the narrow path that you, you defeat in them. The almost like I told you about the discretion of uh, the Chevron de deference they give, an, uh, give a um, an agency, you have to defeat that almost absolute discretion. Isn't that interesting that in a penal side law enforcement, I can use the same words over to the agency side. In other words, your society is still under this umbrella of the militarized, weaponized, immunized cop, so-called code enforcer, policy enforcer, right? And they determine what constitutes threat and resistance. I'm telling you, you don't become that in what you do. And the way you become a non-threat, other, I mean, we might see the threat being recording the witness, and I think that works on them differently. You become the witness when you become an investigative reporter. An investigative reporter is not actually someone that's engaging, are they? Other than to ask questions, take evidence, and take notes. And that's what you, you turn your mind into that, and that has a tendency to de-escalate a whole lot of this as well. But you're working for the point where they, uh, they almost is, where they don't have absolute discretion. You develop that. Going on, this is the, uh, and he talks about the uh, First Amendment rights. That's before, you First Amendment auditors, he's talking then, uh, yes, you're finding more trouble. But I think if you start to interact a little bit more, a little bit, ch play the chess moves farther down the road. Like I told you earlier in the last hour, you're going to be able to engage this a lot better. Uh, why you go out there and do that in one level, I've already said on the air. I, I don't understand that. That's uh, like asking for some trouble. I, I get the point. I get the protest. But my thought is because it's gone so dangerous, why don't you take, instead of doing the stuff that affects people adversely in this society that's kind of been, that's really been uh, stupidized, Better go in to the system uh, professionally, if you will. I mean, deal with them on a uh, on a more um, lawful way, even within their policy, and fix those there. Go in and find what the almost expand in words what the almost absolute discretion is. The almost expand the almost. Explain in writing. Get integrated enough to understand to explain in writing to all these these people that come under color of authority what exactly constitutes what needs to happen in order we stay away from 
this tyrant that there, but I think we can't yet fix. As we were told by the Supreme Court, they've acknowledged uh, during the Civil War, this place changed, folks. And so, for, uh, like I said, you deal with it in that way, you're going to be a lot, I think, farther down the road. We have been, absolutely have been. I just go look. I don't make up any of the authorities that people used to make up. I make up uh, the, the study, uh, the, the factual study, and, the, and make up my notes that reflect copy and paste of what exists properly understood, properly applied, and we have gone so much better down the road with that, with a whole, I mean, it, there really is no, so, uh, he, uh, there's no Achilles heel to that. The only, if there's an Achilles heel, it's in, uh, be, you forget not to speak truth to power when you're not supposed to. And you think that's a weakness. It's not, because I'm going to speak truth to power in the fact that I'm going to prove, given that this is, if you're not a criminal, given that they don't have a plausible uh, articulable basis and other things, I'm going to prove that they had no power. And that is speaking truth to power. It just takes a little longer to get there. And you've got to kick back about that and kind of be calm about getting there. But it's, in a way, without knowing the future, it's a calculated response. And you only get that by reading enough. And I don't know what enough is. I keep reading, finding new, new things all the time. It just it builds, if you have uh, quivers in my air, you know, for my bow, if you will. While my knees are shaking and, uh, and this is all going on when I'm standing there before someone that that can shoot me and kill me, it's not a, it's not fun, but it's necessary. And I've got a different vocabulary, a different string, a string of words I put together, uh, all consistent with their almost. And and again, I can't I can't that was like again a revelation. The narrow path is there. You have to find it. And okay, this is a painful lesson being imparted with every incident in which someone gets arrested and charged with any growing number of contempt charges ranging from resisting arrest and interference with disorderly conduct, obstruction, failure to obey a police order, uh, that uh, they get trotted out any time a citizen voices discontent with the government or challenges or even questions the authority of the powers that be. Well, powers is, a, is that be. You better regard that because they do that. They're going to do it anyway. The point is, is are you in the almost? Are you on the path to divest them from their absolute discretion? They can charge, you can charge, listen, anybody in this country, United States of America, can sue anyone for anything. If you are, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but that can happen to any one of us. And we just have to weather that. We have to go through that. Have you set up the record that none of that can stick? better what I'm telling you, have you made the right discussion, the words out of your mouth that avoid every bit of it? Don't put your, you read some of the examples of the court cases, the example, of, how stupid were these people? Don't get there, folks. Don't put yourself in those conditions. Understand that there are limits. Don't fight the battles that are fightable. Put them on your terms. If they're a surprise to you, have what I'm telling you in you as an automatic response. Have the laws that you're going to be needing around. It sounds stupid, but this is where we are. So you can at least have them as reference in the moment that you at least have something coming out of your mouth that's going to step on the uh, the uh, step into where they're almost absolute is. So you may be contempt uh, in contempt charges. It may be disorderly conduct. It may be obstruction. You should have been in there properly making the record so that, that have, that's uh, made notice that that's not going to stick. Again, it's not an argument. You don't say, oh, I'm going to get you for a disorderly conduct, and you argue about that. He's going to have you. What you then have to turn is said, you have to know in your mind, what are the elements of disorderly conduct? Then you say, how am I going to get on the record between us whether or not he actually has those elements. Why do you do that? Because when you read in the bottom cases, the cops are given the ability to rely on what they thought was the law. They don't have the ability to rely on the law when you gave them notice of it that you were relying on to understand through whether or not they did it that way. All this is doing is it's focusing us on, remember the finger pointing out and three pointing back, pointing back? That's this. But it requires your responsibility to protect yourself. And you'll notice if you read the court cases that they offer, except for that one lawyer that was got for trying to remain silent and still got it, got hit. Except for that case. That's a really interesting condition. But uh, you'll, you'll find out you have a thing to do, and you'll have failed one of the three fingers pointing back. You have failed to identify, first of all, whether or not they have a plausible, re lawful reason which the courts will give them. 
that's in the first uh, first person. If I call it, use the person. Uh, the third the third party where you're standing witnessing something, you may have little zero. I don't know of anything you can do where you can't. You're a third party uh, interloper on the interaction. The the one that's being underneath the scrutiny has to be doing the defense. They have to be doing what I'm talking about now. They have to be the one that's asserting. You can't assert for someone else's rights. And so be careful about trying to be a third party involved. You can be a witness, but be careful about integrating, and you'll see how the integration usually goes for somebody. But anyway, merely a daring to question, challenge, or hesitate when a cop issues an order can get you charged with resisting arrest or disorderly conduct. Free speech be damned. Focus not about free speech. And this article really started to get to me here. I'm starting to read, wait a minute, this is not about free speech. This is about uh, the state, uh, underneath uh, the way the system works, getting in your face over something that they are going to make the record that they have the right to be there. This is not an issue of, a, oh, the, the, the state's a bad thing. This is about the state you live in is this way. And you're going to have to come to terms with that. And you can be charged with anything. And so that's, the, that's just what happens. Are you going to allow the record that you have between them in the first contact to be able to be developed where they can do that? First, secondly, that you have no defense against. The defense would be against a lie. See, when you make the record proper, they might be lying on the report about that. As we hear so many times, stories and reporters come in and look about it, and they do all the, the, the forensic look, and they find out that the lie happens. Because at the time, the people were not smart enough to figure out how to make the record self-evidently a lie. It took someone coming back in to the case in order to do so. So all the cases that had no one coming in after the fact are going to be looking like the government's beating down on people. And I keep looking at all this. A lot of these cases are the people that were under the gun uh, did not respond correctly. For As bad as that sounds to some people that say I shouldn't have to respond correctly. I agree, but that's not reality. It's like I say about the miners. We shouldn't have to respond to an agency request for a plan of operation. We should be able to go leave our, just walk away because it's not, it's not lawful. But do you know when you do that, you, you've done it wrong. You, made, you let them make the record that will convict you. So we shouldn't have to, but we do because if we don't, the system is set up on the administrative side as subjects, presumed to be subjects, you have to respond properly. When we, let's say, just put it in the administrative side, an agency comes and says, you need a plan of operations. Do we talk about a Fourth Amendment right? Do we talk about, uh, do, in fact, I got to the point, do I even talk about the grant other than to say I've got a location? No, folks, we just go to the rule that shows that they don't have the right to ask for that in the letter. And then if they get real stinky about it, then I just point them out that that color of authority they're coming to interfere with my rights is coercion, and it's a felony. And if it interferes with my property, that's extortion. That's another felony. And some states, when those two exist, or maybe independently, that's conversion of my property. See, I'm not getting frothy on this. I'm making a matter-of-fact statement about what my, my reality is that they have mischaracterized. That's another type of felony. Now, I don't have to argue with them. So I'm not arguing. I'm just telling you the, what you, your reliance upon your authority is a felony. And then I say how, and then I shut up. Now, that's, am I shutting up? Am I muzzled, folks? I mean, this is the whole point about this article, saying you're muzzled because these cops are tyrants. No, no, it invokes the requirement that you know more, and I think in a, in a healthy way, actually, the more I think about all this. But is it because you're daring to question or challenge or hesitate when a cop issues an order? Well, see, they're presumed to be doing lawful orders. You are going to be in trouble, unless you can establish that maybe it's not so lawful. Or give yourself just the space of time to question whether it's lawful. And don't, don't challenge the raw edges. Please, step back. You've got to give yourself a distance. They're going to be given a lot of, ab a lot of latitude because they are all absolutely right until you can present the almost. And sometimes that's not before the cop in the first instance. So understand this is a fluid condition. You have to go with the flow, I guess. It's a good point. Maybe that's what will cause all the, uh, the, the broadcast today. But uh, you, you have to be fluid on how, how this all works relative to what you think you're doing. If you don't, they, get the le they have the leverage anyway. 
And so if you don't understand that or you try to make an argument with it or you just give up, and that's the worst one, that, that, that's, that's what he talks about. Or that's what I do agree with it. If you give up, you become that meek guy to, or woman that doesn't want to do what you, you actually ought to do, they love it. I mean, this is the whole point. Argue amongst yourself. Go ahead, argue. They don't care. See, those people don't care. They're still in power. They're the powers that be. Uh, they're, they're the powers that you've allowed. They're the tyrant you've allowed. So, uh, merely daring to question, challenge, or hesitate. Folks, we challenge and we question uh, cops or uh, law enforcement or agencies all the time. Hesitate to, uh, when a cop issues an order. See, they create a problem here where they'll tell you two countermanding the, the actions. You have to call that out immediately. Like, which one? You have to make have a word in your mouth. This is self-defense now. This has nothing to do with the law. Like I said, it became five cops or issuing order. I said, which one of you do I listen to? Who's doing the order? Now, all of a sudden, I got command of the statement. Because now they're listening. They are listening. They're not that stupid. And they realized there was a problem. And they did. They, they were trained to do that. They realized they over, overwhelmed it, but I called them on that. Same thing for you. When it gets there, you have to, whatever it is, this is just one example. Don't get locked into what I'm saying. I'm telling you, go with the flow. You have to be fluid in the moment, but you have to be fluid and know what they are expected to understand and what they've been trained and how to circumvent that so you step you bring them outside of their absolute discretion. That's that's like a burden flipping thing I told you before. It's not free speech, be damned, because underneath this condition, until you get under the cop issuing an order, you don't even have to be under arrest for that, folks. It's not free speech, be damned. It's not a condition of whether or not it's a lawful order, and even then do you want to challenge that. Please do not make the mistake to think that what you think is going to rule that moment. Again, this is an investigation. If, so, if you're a photographer or you're a, an investigative reporter and a cop says move, maybe you should move as you decide how you're going to engage that over a moment. Don't just say no. Bring out the long-form definition. Are, it would be, are you infringing? How are you not? I actually say it this way. How are you not infringing on my right of the press? And listen for the answer. Don't be wordy, wordy. Listen for the answer. You've just thrown in the almost. He relied on his authority to lawfully tell you something, and you said, but I may have a right to be here. What is your, How are you not in violation of this? And he would say, but that's not relevant because of this. Now you get into this dialogue, right? But if he decides he's not going to put up with it, don't fight the man. He's got a gun. A taser? Pepper spray? Friends? Play this thing the way it ought to be played so you keep yourself out of as much jeopardy as possible. When it starts to build up, then you better bring the you better bring your own art artillery to a, a non fight. You you bring the words that the, the artillery you bring are the words that they are liable to. Then they know this. Reading more. In fact, getting charged or arrested is now the best scenario for encounters with police who are allowed to operate under the assumption that their word is law and that there is no room for any form of disagreement or even question. That's true. But he says this is an administrative condition, isn't it? Because he says the word is law, is as law, is an agency discussion of enforcement on the executive side. That's not law. That's agency. That's administration. He's got a gun. Don't argue with him. The best case scenario might be that you get arrested, because otherwise you're dead. What if I'm offering? Well, you can, and when there's opportunity, proper, you properly engage it. I have found you may avoid the arrest. You may avoid the charge. You Then, if you didn't, you then have a better record to move in on in the first instance. It's not an argument going to trial either, if, uh, if you heard what I said before. It becomes a motion to set aside, or uh, some sort of uh, avoidance. Free plea remedy and avoidance, and an equity, a collateral equity attack. By then, by then you probably collected up the prosecutor because they usually make a violation on their on their on their statements as well. And I'm getting a little more deep than I wanted to get here, but the point is, is that are you are you muzzled, folks? I guess is the point. Are you are you stripped of all action? You are those that they've been taking away, but you're not of the ones that defend yourself. Is it about free speech? No, it's about life and death, first of all, and then it's about a, 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 a response to out the, the actually out the criminality, the tyrant itself. Why? Because they work on the assumption their word is law. What did I say? You defeat that. You don't defeat that as an argument. 
You bring it as a question and maybe multiple steps in short statements. Small statements. You don't go on and on. What did I say before? You have a, your tail light is out. Well, how is that not in violation of my of the road law? This section right here given to the authority of the county, of which their authority cannot 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 uh, enforce that against me. What's your lawful authority to do so? Where well, the law says you don't have it, folks. Did you hear about my right to drive there? Did you hear about my right to travel? Did you hear about the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment? No, I'm asserting a response back at the first time of appointment uh, of, a, of, a, of addressment with a cop about the law that's going to be brought to him in the future that he's going to have to stand on the stand and sit there and say, "Did you know? Did you know about that?" And he's going to have to say, no, he didn't. In fact, he didn't even consider it. And therefore, he likely does not have probable cause. In fact, he can probably show that he doesn't at that point. I'm not going to argue with the guy. I'm not going to pledge the Declaration of Independence or restate the Declaration of Independence. I'm going to get to what they are, what they've been given to do. I'm going to defeat that. I'm going to defeat that as fast as I can. Will I defeat it with him or her? No, not necessarily. But I've done it on the record, and I can make a record that it was done, and I can re-invoke it and re-invoke it and re-invoke it. I think at this point I'm not shot, and I've and I've done exactly what he said. The best case scenario is I got arrested, because otherwise I'm dead anymore. We should have never got there. That we're here proves we're not in that republic, that in the beginning of the article, uh, where he says that a uh, republic is kept by this. Folks, you can... You can have the right, you can scream your brains out in jail. They'll let you give you your right to free speech. You can scream your brains out and turn blue in the face. It won't affect that system. Your First Amendment means nothing to that. You've got to find out what starts to make something. And I'm telling you, you'll find it in the almost. Where they have absolute power, they don't have absolute power. They have almost absolute power. That's those savings provisions. That's those obstructions that they are not supposed to transgress that you have to have in your mouth relative to the way they see it, which is these statutes that we call, talk about. The worst case scenario involves getting probed, beaten, tasered, tackled, searched, zipped, seized, stripped, manhandled, shot, or, or killed by cops. Yeah, all that, folks. So are you going to, that's the reality. Are you going to walk into that, or are you going to try and do some things as best you can the way I've been suggesting and make at least to have another day so you don't, you, you limit, you limit how many times they can think they can pull that out. That's all deciding that they have the right to do it. I'm saying you learn enough to, they don't, they, you get in their brain that they have no justification to. That requires you are maintaining calm, beyond calm, um, in, intellect almost beyond your, your knowledge of it. It'll come out and you're doing what you have to do. Not what you think you have to do. And he goes on talking about like garnish. In this article, he garnishes some support, like he's on our side, like uh, this you know, goose stepping. All these words. That get, oh yeah, this guy's on the right side. I don't think he is actually. As I see, he doesn't offer anything. What I'm telling you about how we go through to avoid a lot of this, notwithstanding that it exists. The mindset that anyone who wears a government uniform, soldier police officer, police guard, prison guard, you see how he's, even if it's not intentionally, do you see how he keeps leading with the military uh, folks? This is just what's going on. Uh, whether he wants to agree or understands he's done that, uh, this has been a consistent thread throughout this, and yet he'll deny this whole thing to you by not offering some other points like I have, and why I'm talking to you today about it. And again, going on now the second hour, amazing. A mindset that uh, who wears a government uniform, soldier, police officer, prison guard, that must be obeyed without question is a telltale sign of authoritarianism, good stepping its way uh, towards totalitarianism. Yes, pretty strict, pretty set up. That's a truth, folks. And you're there when you don't do some of the things I'm telling, or don't prepare to do some of these things, or work underneath the rationale that keeps you meek at some level. And I extend that to that when you see harm done to someone else, if you expect to live in a world where everyone thinks about each other, you need to kind of look outside of your own. Once you got yourself settled down, maybe you can look out and help others. That's that charity thing. You don't have to do it, but I think we're better for it if we do. Now, he goes on to say, and the rationale, I don't even want to go over the rationale. The rationale is, ultimately, uh, he goes through how the cop's attitude is 
you'll do exactly what I say and all this and do it as I say and all that other stuff. And ultimately he comes up with the, it's literally comply or die. Yes, it is. That's the truth. It is what they do. But he said almost absolute discretion. In other words, he can have that attitude and you can face off to it and lose or else you can find a way to sidestep it, not face off and he can lose. He loses at the point if he intended to justify the killing of you, he can't. Or the beating of you, he can't. The tasering, he can't. It is comply or die. He's speaking the truth here. But it's not absolute. It's almost absolute. And now, can you even bring the question? To, why does he bring the question of the question of whether or not a constitutional republic exists under the free speech aspect when he's talking about comply or die down here? He's not even talking about the same world he starts out with. Except the title says it's after arrest. And then he commingles outside of arrest, before arrest, the, the condition without the condition, uh, the reality. Uh, then he goes on to some, and I don't want to go through it. This is where I just want to stop now talking because I've just explained now further what I've said. He goes to the point of Kambalaya Dai. This whole article now starts to bring up bunches of stories of everyone doing it wrong or the uh, system who tells you how it is. And I'm ca cautioning everybody who thinks they live in the Constitutional Republic that thinks that there's a right that way. It's just self guaranteed like we hear it's supposed to be. In other words, not encroached. Look around you folks. The whole world has not got law. I mean, everyone's complaining there's no law. Take that to the bank. What the United States does out there to people, it's doing inside. It sets you up. And if we would have got to the tabs today, there's, again, it's endless evidence. I'm trying all the places you can find uh, that are there that we all plug into in order to bring this on us and take away our ability to speak. The state's not muzzling us. The lesson in this for me was that knowledge, experience tells me we have muscled ourselves. We listen to this nonsense. We think that what he's saying is all con it would be relevant to a particular case. Case law is a serious defect to, to be dealing with, folks. That's your common law for all of you that think it comes organic uh, by the uh, local people. Common law is, is actually judge-made law. Now that it's statutory and policy, it's the corporate, if you will, the private de, de facto determinations of judges within their system for their system. Is it any wonder it's really looking kind of un, unrecognizable? And yet they can almost have absolute discretion. This almost really, i got to tell you, if you don't understand the revelation of that, you have to look until you get that as a revelation. Remember they told us it was a narrow path in the valley of the shadow of death. That's it. And you walk there, your likelihood to make it another day is very much improved. Your ability to go beyond and to defend yourself or cause it not to happen on, on you is also increased and leverage, and you at least, whether or not you'll ever, will ever see it uh, in, my, in our lifetimes, in my lifetime, there's a mentality coming now, slowly, ever so slowly, painfully slow, that's starting to finally get this back. That remedy may be actual, not the building of a record that shows it's been, it hasn't, it hasn't been perfected. That it takes, it's going to take us all, is why I say, we're kind of beyond anybody being the champion of much of anything. It's why right now when you stand up the wrong way, you get beat down. And yet I know myself and others that stand up uh, by ourselves, out in the middle of nowhere a lot of times, and it's a casual conversation, and they never do, they never do anything that we say, anything that incriminates us, and we do everything to incriminate them. We get them to incriminate them. It's not even out of our mouth. We ask the question that sets the standard, that it complies with what the court was going to give to them, and we we press that. You have probable cause. What's your articulable basis? He has to give it to us. Otherwise, on the record, I can go to the next step. You haven't told me your articulable basis for a crime. And for all you guys that are out there doing the First Amendment, I have to commend those of you that caught the point that said, when they came back with, oh, the, but we got a complaint. You guys that came back, and this don't, don't sell yourself into this is the holy grail. This is just one of the good ones that comes back out after, as a response. When they come back, oh, we got a call from a concerned citizen, you say, that is not the articulable crime that you were supposed to tell me. That's a perfect follow-up question of what I'm talking about. 
don't think that's the Holy Grail. That's one of a few because you're now in, in a conversation that you're going to have to have. That, that is what I'm talking about. You ask for the articulable basis, he says, uh, as I've heard, oh, we got a complaint. That's not the articulable basis that is the sta by the standard of the courts, which says that that articulable basis has to be of a crime committed. Guess what the next step is? That he witnessed the cop. And so if you understand this lineage and you see and you read these things in the court, you make your list of questions. You have those with you. Nothing is a holy grail. It's just a lineage of positions and points you're making with a record that you may avoid at that point the problem or will have at your disposal in a defense or avoidance. First of all, avoidance before plea or as a defense after plea. When you get him on the stand, you start needling him on the same questions again. You've got to get that on the record. And I found that kind of interesting. It was uh, my first case. In fact, after I learned how to do that, I, hadn't, I didn't get many opportunities. They didn't want to mess with me much. It was kind of an interesting thing. I don't know what that means. I don't know what, I just know I haven't had to deal with it in that depth anymore. Because uh, I think I, I was a porcupine, folks. I didn't act, I didn't act all vicious and threat and resistance. I, I just said, listen, I, you, you, you're attacking me here and you better be careful on what you, what you touch. Maybe don't, Maybe don't uh, put your hands around me like you have been. You're going to get yourself stuck. I'm not going to stick you. You're going to stick yourself. Right? So what am I saying? I have the, I have the right to be left alone. I'm making. I'm telling you in words, uh, don't touch me. Leave me alone. Now, there's going to be some people that they might want to not leave you alone. No guarantees. But I hope today I've given you a ton to think about and how to approach this. Like I said, the subtlety of last... Last week, you look like a migrant. You're not a migrant. I hope no one took that on. Take that on at least to get you motivated to say, oh, that's what I look like. But that's not what you're doing. You're looking different than what the jurisdiction is claiming authority to do. But different than today. They come with a probable cause. They even make a statement. You have to listen very carefully to what their statement is and see whether or not you have an alternative existence to provide in the black and white. Not your opinion. And keep, I guess, one more thing here. Keep ahead of how the system moves and adjusts to all that so that you're not trapped by these phrases like, like they're now trapping everybody. Am I free to go? They just come back and tell you no. And guess what? You have a whole bunch now because they said that you should have more simple questions to ask making the record that they may think is a threat, but it's not the kind of actionable threat they need to go to, go to force. The threat is that you're tracking down, they're making it up. You don't tell them they're making it up. You catch them in the failure of the things the court says they were supposed to do. I hope, I mean, that's a big deal right there. I hope you understand the subtlety on how you approach it. It's not a confrontation. It's an expo exposure. Like I said, the best thing I come up with is it's a private investigator, do the investigation real time, in the moment, under the threat, calm, with the right questions to elicit and bring out from them that they didn't have the requirements that they were supposed to have. In other words, they can't rely on those actions. And later, if you survive, and you should at that point, being everything's calm and you're just going by the situation of their failures, that you get it maybe into the court if you have to, if you have to, and you have a word in your mouth. Actually, you're not even doing that. You're asking them the same questions in the stand, and he's got to, or she has to, elicit those as testimony. No, well, I'll stop there. You'll, you'll find a whole new story about that part, like I've told you before we found out. But anyway, I hope this, uh, this article, I didn't really intend it for the whole day, uh, but there it is. Uh, be careful in what we're told. However good the, uh, you know, hit, uh, um, the white head is, however good a guy is, I, I don't know about that. What he's writing is very dangerous. I hope you see there's an alternative, and I hope you can think about that and put that into your thoughts as we move forward and keep yourself safe, folks. Thank you, Grimner, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and jewels over ucy.tv. Thank you very much for the simulcast and all y'all that are rebroadcasting and all that. And whatever you're doing to get the message out, folks, keep safe. Keep a head on this thing. Keep a head of this thing. And I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast. This is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>